Time now for the Educated Retirement Show with your host, Jay Kaplan. Jay discusses reverse mortgages and can answer your questions at 951-922-3532. Call lines are open at 951-922-3532. And now, here's Jay. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second half of the uh, retirement. We've made it halfway through, like I think most people at retirement, like me, I'm 75, I've made it halfway through, right? So we were talking about, uh, actually, let's take another quick look at the uh, website, which is either the Educated Retirement Radio.com. I don't have my monitor, so I'm not sure. I think I'm okay, though. But our director, Kathleen, has a monitor. So anyway, uh, or NASA, Nelly, I should say. No, I don't need to look at it all the time. I see enough of myself. And our phone number, 866-955-2233. There we go. And remember, call me just to find out anything, okay? Just to talk about anything. Just to talk over strategy. And who else you may need to talk with for strategy. It doesn't mean you want to buy anything. There will never be any pressure. And once I get any information from you, like your phone number or email, you're not going to keep getting BS from me all the time. You just won't. It's nothing you're going to have to opt out of. But, of course, that's always out there. National Catfish Day is today, a day to celebrate the value of farm-raised catfish, although I do like most fish that's wild better, and was designated in 1987 by President Ronald Reagan. These nocturnal swimmers don't have scales and are a good source of vitamin D. It's a favorite fish of many Americans and can be prepared several ways, but can also be considered as some of the weirdest fish out there. I usually see it, especially Southern restaurants. It's going to be fried. Fried is very good. There's a lot of other ways to eat it. Uh, some have multiple rows of needle sharp teeth and some give off electricity, which is something I learned today. Even though I do watch a fairly regularly Jeremy Wade's show of river monsters. So some swip upside down or have razors on their sides. Ooh. The catfish can weigh as much as 660 pounds and up to 10 and a half feet long. Uh, catfish caught in Thailand, uh, there was one, one 646 pounds about the size of a grizzly bear. It took 10 men to lift it. That was probably a gooch in that, being in that part of the world. A, a popular way to catch these fish in the Southern United States is called noodling. Not the kind of noodling I like, which is to eat noodles and pasta, but that's when the fishermen use their bare hands, no bait, real respect and they stick there. I've seen that on TV and it looks pretty weird. The practice is illegal in some states due to concerns over the safety of the noodler uh, because I think some of those people have noodles in their brains maybe, but you know, I understand the other side of it, how exciting that might be. As the fish are very strong, no kidding, and can easily put a person down under the water. There are also concerns about the sustainability of the fish. The best way to acknowledge this holiday is to eat a catfish on a plate, deep fried, pan fried, baked or grilled, or you can watch killer fish movies like Leviathan, 20 Leagues Under the Sea, which I think is more like, you know, the octopus thing. But octopus is great too. Uh, piranha, which... Do you know that uh, Guillermo del Toro actually directed uh, Piranha 2 or, or our favorite 4th of July movie, Jaws? So we're approaching Shark Week, which I thought was kind of a joke on uh, Discovery Channel, but I watched it, most of it last year, and you know what? It was good. And uh, let me show you some, some pictures regarding Shark Week, etc. 
kind of hard to put on with these. Uh, but when there's a will, there's a way. And there is a good looking catfish that hopefully you will enjoy. I'm not sure what type of catfish it is, but here's our friend Jeremy with a gooch that he spent. You know, he probably on his shows, he probably catches the fish he wants the first time he throws the hook out there, but they have to rearrange or re-edit the show to make it look like it's the last thing that happens. But that's okay. It does have drama. But I thought that was a good picture. Look at the size of that sucker. And here's a close it's a close up that you want to see with that this is a gooch, I know that. And and some of those people in Southeast Asia and other parts where uh, the gooch, they see the gooch and catch it, they fear it to the extent of thinking of it this way. So that's not necessarily something you might want to eat, but could definitely e easily eat you. And actually those big catfish have been known to do that kind of thing. So what about this show? Well, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe families and people need to be active, not reactive. So whose birthday is it today? Well, last week it was Richard Boone. And as you, you recall the show we had, the last show we had their guest on, that was with uh, Joe Franco. And, uh, you know, he was kind of young, so I'm not sure he understood the have gun will travel, but he has the accounting office will travel. But there you are. I'm sure most of us on this show understand him. He was born June 18th, uh, 1917, and he earned his wings in 1981. Richard Allen Boone was an American actor who starred in over 50 films and most notable in Westerns. Richard was born um, in Los Angeles to a corporate lawyer and fourth grade, and fourth grade, fourth great grandson of Squire Boone, who was a brother to frontiersman Daniel Boone. Did you get that? I guess I did. I tripped over my tongue. Uh, but he was a fourth great grandson of Squire Boone, who was a brother to Dan Daniel Boone. Uh, let me show you a younger picture, because I think it's still incredibly and easily uh, recognizable. But this, this guy was a great talent, and he really got into his profession if you remember what he did with repertory theaters and things like that. But he graduated from Hoover High in Glendale and attended Stanford University. He dropped out of Stanford prior to graduation and worked as an oil rigger, bartender, painter, and writer. He joined the Navy and served on three ships in the Pacific during World War II. And after the war, he studied acting at the Actors Studio in New York. His Broadway uh, debut was Medina, starring Judith Anderson, who we all love from Rebecca, Rebecca of course, and so many others. Uh, and uh, John uh, Gielgud, uh, starring Jude Medina. Also, John Gielgud was in that, and it ran 214 performances. Director Ilya Kazan used Boone to feed lines to an actress for a film screen test and was not impressed with the actress, but was impressed with Boone's voice. And he did have a boony, booming voice, as I recall. So, uh, so he sent him to Hollywood where he had a contract with 20th Century Fox Studios. Richard made his screen debut in Halls of Montezuma and several other roles followed, one of which was the first motion picture to be filmed in widescreen cinemascope or in that process, The Robe. And of course we remember The Robe. 
And here are the robe. It says uh, compo music composed by Alfred Newman, but who know because Alfred Newman was the uh, the head of the music department. And sometimes that's the only people that get credit. But this is look widescreen edition, special widescreen edition. So there they are. And uh, following was beneath the 12 mile reef, which I, as a kid anyway, I liked a lot. I don't remember too much lately, but have we seen this lately? No, but you know, I guess I should. Uh, I remember the music from the robe though very well. I also remember the old scene that had red drapes over the screen, whether there was actually drapes over the screen or not. And in my day, there used to be in some cases, but this had it on uh, on film. And uh, anyway, that was also filmed in the same process. He became friends with Jack Webb, who produced TV's Dragnet at the time. And Boone starred in the film version in 1954, as well as a lead role in Webb's TV medical drama medic in which richard received an emmy nomination nomination for best actor and he continued to get lots of parts mostly in westerns his next series made him a national star have gun will travel which ran from 1957 to 63 1963 and earned him two emmy nominations uh, Richard Donner, Ida Lapina, Richard Boone, and William Conrad, among others, directed episodes for the show. So he did direct seven, but he's got a lot of actors. And in some cases, well, of course, Richard Don Donner was a director all along. Ida Lapino became a very good director. Uh, so uh, Boone himself directed 28 of them. Gene Roddenberry of the Star Trek there wrote 24 episodes other writers included our old buddy richard matheson as well as sam peckinpah and filming locations were on irving street just below melrose avenue as well as locations in bishop lone pine and hotel carlton i didn't know what hotel that was until just recent but i, I know the hotel carlton of course, but I didn't recognize it as part of the series in San Francisco. Lots of guest stars, Charles Bronson, John Carradine, Lon Chaney Jr., Angie Dickinson, Peter Falk, Vincent Price, Harry Dean Stanton, to name a few, Richard Herman composed and conducted the opening theme, as he did with almost all of the Hitchcock films and uh, Citizen Kane. Boone was nominated five times for primetime Emmys. Here's a short list of his films. And I don't know about the TV, but we'll get into that in a second. Uh, the Robe, which we already talked about with uh, Richard Burton, Victor Mature, won two Academy Awards and three Academy Award nominations. And as we said before, it was the first to be uh, filmed in widescreen or uh, real widescreen. So Beneath the 12 Mile Reef, 1953, also released in Cinemascope, starred Robert Wagner, Gilbert Rowland, Peter Graves, Dragnet, 1954, directed and starred Jack Webb, Dennis Weaver, who we talked about last time, Lee Marvin, and the sons of Lee Marvin. Don't forget that. You learned that right here in Leonard Nimoy. I Bury the Living which I'm not sure, uh, horror author Stephen King listed this film as one of his favorite films. I, I haven't seen it. I'm going to look it up. The Alamo, 1960, uh, which he was the great-grandson of the brother of uh, Boone, uh, directed, uh, oh, directed by and starred John Wayne, also starred Richard Widmark and Curtis from Gunsmoke. Now, is Ken Curtis the singer guy that we talked about? And, uh, you know, I don't want to run out of too much time here, but he was what? He was a singer. He took Frank Sinatra's play singing, I think, and he was also an actor on Gunsmoke as well as other things. Also, Lawrence Harvey and the film won one Academy Award, nominated for six Academy Awards. And uh, there you are. This is the soundtrack 
and in Todd A O. And uh, big letters on here says uh, John Wayne, Richard Widmark, Rich Lawrence Harvey, and then uh, special guest star Richard Moon in big letters. Dimitri Tiamkin, by the way, did that. And I'm going to play that as soon as I get a uh, amplifier back. He was in Ombre, 1967, uh, Long Hot Summer, HUD, Sounder, Norma Ray, starring uh, Paul Newman, Frederick Mark, Barbara Rush. It came from outer space. Barbara Rush was. Oh, Barbara Rush was. It came space. from outer space. Uh, the Big Sleep, which I've got versions of, and uh, of course, I don't have one right with me. But remember the remake, which wasn't bad. You know, you know the first one was, was of course, uh, Humphrey Bogart. There was a remake with Robert Mitchum, and you know, I can't help but show this again. I'm not going to talk about it, but you know, I don't want people to forget. I don't necessarily want you to listen to it, but you know, I don't want you to forget any of that. Uh, anyway, so The Big Sleep uh, was uh, with Robert Mitchum as Philip Marlowe, also Al Reed, James Stewart, Joan Collins, The Last Dinosaur, which also, oh, that's a Japanese-American production where Boone played a big game hunter owning a multi-million dollar company that drills for oil under the polar caps. This time he is searching for a T-Rex. So let's get into, speaking of movies, Roger Ebert. And Roger Ebert was uh, born June 18th of 1942. So, and uh, this is another one from last week that I didn't want to pass by. And he died much too young. In fact, both he, Siskel and Ebert, both died of cancer, both too young. So he was an American film critic, film historian, and journalist. And uh, this is kind of the way we remember him. With a thumbs up, of all things, which became iconic in the movie critique industry. Here's a younger lad of Roger Ebert. Uh, still recognizable, but uh, not necessarily the demeanor we remember him is. And here he is with his partner, Cisco and Ebert. And uh, there they are, both one thumbs up, one thumbs down. But they were they were so good together. Uh, can't say more about that. So uh, he reported for the Chicago Sun Times from 1967 until his death. So Ebert became the first film critic to win the Pulitzer Prize for criticism and the first film critic to be awarded a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So figure that one out. That sounds awfully good. He was born in Urbana, Illinois, and I think I think HAL 9000, which we mentioned earlier, was also created in Urbana, Illinois. Have to look, have to check that out again. Haven't been that long since I saw that movie. And he had an interest in journalism in high school where he was a sports writer for the local News Gazette. However, he began his writing career with letters of comment to the science fiction fantasies of the era. And, you know, he was the one, uh, not Siskel, he was the one that, that really liked the science fiction films. So after college, Ebert sold freelance pieces that he wrote to the Daily News and was hired as a reporter and feature writer at the Chicago Sun-Times. Review, reviewing over 200 movies a year here and he and critic Gene Siskel hosted shows like uh, sneak previews I remember that sneak previews 1972 to 1982 and then Siskel and Ebert after their sh names became more uh, uh, popular and more well known Fiscal and Ebert at the movies was from 1986 to 1999. So they spent a lot of time uh, on the air, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, these were movie review shows that made their thumbs up, thumbs down, 
gestures iconic then and of, of course the uh the uh pharaohs of not the pharaohs but the, the uh the roman emperors they also did thumbs up and thumbs down but those were different i don't know how many people know thumbs up meant to shove the knife up into the person and thumbs down actually meant for them to live but that's a, but we don't care about that right now Art Bell was also from last week. When how can we skip Art Bell? You know what? How can we skip another sip of coffee for me? Here's to everyone out there. So, Art Bell, June 17th, 1945 uh, to 2018. So he was only, he's basically my age and he's already gone. Uh, Arthur William Bell III, so I guess the bell has to ring three times, was an American broadcaster and author. He was the founder and original host of the paranormal-themed radio program, Coast to Coast AM. And that, well, I don't know how it fares these days, but when he was on it, I know it was the number one syndicated show in the country. Uh, My mother used to stay up half the night to listen to it. It's just crazy. It's just crazy popular, and that's because it was really the only one of its kind. So, Art was born in North Carolina and was always interested in radio, just like me. At the age of 13, he became a licensed amateur radio operator after leaving military service. He worked as a disc jockey for a radio station in Okawa, uh, Okinawa. While there, he set a business world record, staying on air for 116 hours and 15 minutes. Uh, Sean, isn't that how long this show lasts? 116 hours and 15 minutes. I'm sure you want it to last that long. But Sean's our engineer, by the way. The money raised for this event allowed him to to charter a plane to Vietnam and rescue 120 or- orphans stranded in Saigon and eventually brought to the U.S. and adopted by American families. I know he had, he did a lot of very good things that were not connected with the paranormal. And after returning to the United States, he worked in cable television. Remember cable television? That's what they, now it's just television used to be pay TV. Now we always, we all pay. And we paid because there was no commercials. And now we pay and we still get commercials. Anyway, he began to host Coast to Coast with 460 stations. That's where he started. Uh, This program is starting with one station. So just to give you some, uh, you know, perspective. He earned praise from those who felt the paranormal deserves a mature outlet as well as those simply amused by the nightly parade of bizarre and fringe topics. And you got to admit, even if you don't believe in all of that stuff, I don't believe in all of that stuff. I find so much of it entertaining. And uh, those he interviewed were uh, Dean Koontz, author, who I really like. Chris Carter from the X-Files, Leonard Nimoy, Dan Aykroyd, who, as you may or may not know, he is a big-time UFO fanatic and paranormal fanatic. And uh, I hate to use the word fanatic. Let's just say fan. And uh, he also makes uh, vodka and wine, I think, too. Anyway, Casey Kasem, uh, physicist. Miko Kaku, who I really like, and I've got his book right behind me here, and the the, the, the brain book. Uh, Astronomer Seth Shostak. Oh, here it is. Miku Kaku, The Future of the Mind. Got this at Morro Bay, my wife got for me while I was sipping coffee at Big Dog Cafe. And uh, anyway... Uh, astronomer Seth Shostak, which is probably a good guy, but he's always putting down and debunking UFO stuff because he's in charge of uh, SETI, S-E-T-I, the Search for Intelligence, uh, S-E, Search for Intelligence, anyway. Uh, search for Extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial 
Yeah, so, and he wants to keep his job. And I don't know if you've ever done it, but you can help SETI by using a, uh, a SETI uh, screensaver that actually uh, has your computer hooked into theirs and uh, allows you to help look for these ETs. Gordon Lightfoot and George Carlin, just to name a few of the people that were on his show. In 1996, Bell was criticized for reporting rumors that Com Comet Halbob was being trailed by a UFO. And I think we know the rest of the story there, which we won't get into now. In 1997, a caller into the show claimed he had discovered an unknown threat and conspiracy from Area 51 and his wife was in danger by even talking of his life was in danger by even talking about it. For unknown reasons, Bell lost connection to his transmitter during the call, which means the government turned it off. And the Adled's voice became more and more agitated when the entire broadcast uh, drastically went silent. I wonder if that was, what's his name? Uh, we went to see the movie, but I can never remember. Can you remember the guy? That, oh, um, uh, the Area 51 guy. Yeah, the guy that worked there. Anyway, it's coming. Uh, my director is looking it up. Uh, anyway. A confused bell restored the signal about 20 minutes later. It was mentioned on another show that the caller hoaxed the whole discussion, or did they? It had never been fully explained. So we're going to go on now to somebody else who was never Bob full. Lazar. Oh, Bob Lazar, but I, well, I have no proof of that whatsoever. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, by the way is also a very fascinating character and somewhat tragic all in all, but what a life. Anyway, Anthony was a high, oh, you know what? I got a picture too of Art Bell. So let me show that to you. Ouch, sorry about that. There he is in his studio office. And then I have a close up of pretty much the same thing. Is that the same equipment in the background? No, not exactly. But that's Art Bell now. Uh, I'm not sure why he passed away or what. The, I know he had death threats for certain reasons. I don't know. I'll report on it when I find out more. But Anthony Bourdain was highly honored American chef, author, and travel documentarian. And you know what? What we're going to do right now so that we don't run out of time is bring back NASA Nelly because she's orbiting right now. And I think we want to make sure we don't run out of time for her. So let me, uh, I'm listening right now for her, uh, for her retro rockets. Nope, oh, there she is. Okay. So NASA Nelly, to first tell us who you're going to talk about now. The Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting. Okay. We are about to answer that question you've been asking for so long, which is, where did the term flying saucers come from anyway? Remember the Maury Island incident in 1947? It featured the legendary fallen molten debris from a UFO over Maury Island off of Washington State that struck a boat worker and killed the ship captain's dog. Just three days after, on June 24th, Kenneth Arnold, an expert pilot and respected businessman, flew his plane near Mount Rainier, Washington. He had over 9,000 total flying hours with almost half of which were devoted to search and rescue Mercy Flyer efforts. It was clear skies and a light breeze when he saw a bright light, just a flash like a glint of sun as it hits a mirror when the glass is angled just so. It had a bluish tinge. At first he thought the light must have been coming from another plane. There were nine flashes in rapid succession. He said, they passed almost directly in front of me with a wingspan to be of at least 100 feet across. Arnold would later describe the airborne objects as flying in a diagonally step-down formation, stretching about five miles, and they weaved from side to side, flipping and darting around. They were not jets or birds, and as he figured, they were traveling at approximately 1,700 miles an hour, and he said, they look like a pie pan, something like a pie plate that was cut in half, saucer-like or like a big flat disc. 
after Arnold landed, he told the staff and friends about the objects he had seen. The story spread quickly and reporters were at attention. When interviewed, he said that they flew like a saucer if you skip it across the water. That's all the reporters needed to hear to produce the headline, Supersonic Flying Saucers Sighted by Idi um, Idaho Pilot. So there you go. That's your answer. After his sighting, he became a minor celebrity, and for about a decade, he was somewhat involved in interviewing other UFO witnesses and wrote two books and several magazine articles about the sighting as well as other research. As Kenneth was interviewed in 1950 by Edward R. Murrow, they discussed how the label of flying saucer was termed as a historical misquote. Arnold said, these objects more or less fluttered like they were boats on very rough water and very rough air of some type. And when I described how they flew, I said they flew like a saucer when you throw it across the water. He proceeded to say, if it's not made by our science or our army air forces, I'm inclined to believe it's of an extra extraterrestrial origin. Documents from the Project Blue Book, the UFO files disclose Arnold's life after flying saucers. I haven't had a moment of peace since I first told the story, he said. He said a preacher called him from Texas and informed him that the strange objects were actually signs of doomsday and that he should get his clocks ready for the end of the world. Arnold said a woman rushed in to take a look at him and then dashed out shrieking, there's the man who saw the men from Mars. He said the whole thing has gotten out of hand. Half the people look at me as a combination Einstein, Flash Gordon, and Screwball. None of these things caused him to change his mind. The uh, Kenneth Arnold sighting remains to be another detailed occurrence in the summer of saucers. Thank you very, very much, uh, NASA Nelly. Let's hear your... Oh, you're gone already. I put this up just for interest. I put up that man from Mars just for interest. You know, I was thinking about this, and we were talking earlier about how we don't all believe the fantastic stories. But this place here, I've been out here and through the Integratron and Giant Rock. Uh, during the 1950s, they had the most amazing gatherings where you would hear about the surface of Mars and everybody that was abducted in the interior of all these flying saucers. You know, I think I wish... Not that I'd been to either one, but I think that would be more important to me than to have been at Woodstock. So, so there. So let me get back to Anthony. So, uh, uh, you know, watching his TV shows, No Reservations and Parts Unknown enables us to spend time with a real life explorer who trotted around the world in search of things that make us human. He was a lot more than just a f chef, food critic, and, and food host. He wanted us to break out of our comfort zones and see the world through the eyes of people he would never otherwise meet. Anthony was born in New York City and grew up in New Jersey. His father was a salesman at a New York City camera store as well as floor manager at a record store. Boy, he's got everything there that I like. He later became an ex executive of Columbia Records. Whoa, all right. And his mother was a staff editor at the New York Times. So these were some of the best times at Columbia Records with their studio on uh, 30th Street in lower Manhattan with, uh, you know, with the Kind of Blue and all those others that were, I mean, all of those records are just great sounding. Anyway, his love of food developed once he tried his first oyster on a fisherman's boat with his parents on vacation in France. After two years at Vassar College, he dropped out. We got all, so many successful people who are dropouts. And of course, don't forget Spielberg, who was just never accepted at USC because he they thought he wasn't good enough. He then worked in seafood restaurants in Massachusetts, and this inspired his decision to to pursue cooking as a career. Do we have a, we got a couple, let me break for a couple of pictures. Uh, we got some flying saucers up here on the top of these pictures, but there he is a little bit younger. 
And there's the flying saucers, as you can see, ready to take off. All right, and there he is looking a little younger, which is kind of a cool picture of him. And uh, this is kind of the way we remember him lately. Cup of coffee, though, that's always good to have. And uh, this one, which looks like he may have a few problems brewing in there, but you know, I, I, I kind of would like to know why he did what he did, but I don't know that, and maybe none of us ever will. Uh, but Bourdain graduated from the Culinary Institute of America and went on to run various restaurant kitchens in New York City. He became an executive chef at Brasserie Les Hayes in Manhattan and remained there for many years. Earlier in his career, he submitted unsolicited work to literary magazines and wrote two culinary mysteries, Bone in the Throat. Wow and Gone Bamboo. These first attempts at publishing did not do particularly well, but later his articles and essays appeared in many periodicals, including the New Yorker, Los Angeles Times, and The Observer, to name a few, and his book Kitchen Confidential Adventures in the Culinary Underbelly was a best seller with sales over one million copies. Anthony became, I think that's very unusual for uh, a chef or a cookbook or a kind of a cookbook because you know he always got into other things. Uh, di director, could you pull out that cookbook uh, of the one I use for gumbo? You know, the we went to Star's restaurant, remember? I'm trying to think of his name. It's very big. It's not thick. It's just very big. Uh, so Anthony became uh, a series host for TV f food and travel shows such as A Cook's Tour, No Reservations, and Parts Unlo Unknown. He frequently advocated for communicating the value of traditional peasant food and praised the quality of freshly prepared street food in other countries. Now, director... Miss Director, Miss Director, can you just look up the uh, owner or the executive chef for Stars? That's for Stars Restaurant, San Francisco. Uh, he was noted for his put downs of celebrity chefs such as Paula Dean, Bobby Flay, Guy Fieri, and Rachel Ray. He said that the playing of music by Billy Joel, Elton John, or Grateful Dead in his kitchen was grounds for firing, even though Joel was a fan of his and visited his restaurants. On his No Reservations and Parts Unknown, he dined with and interviewed many, many musicians and prominent individuals, not just chefs. One meal in particular was with President Obama in a Hanoi, Vietnam restaurant. They had a $6 meal of noodles and beers. Ooh, sounds good. At Ban Cha Hong Lin, the event was so memorable that the restaurant took the metal tap tables that they both sat at and encased it in glass, complete with staged plates chopsticks and beer yeah it is an attraction of its own as a sort of shrine slash museum slash photo op so uh yeah you got it i just need this the man's name but it's in the script as well is it really okay Anthony's last episode of Parts Unknown was a visit with friend John Lurie at John's New York apartment. Lurie is a musician, painter, actor, and director. He co-founded the Lounge Lizards Ensemble, and after suffered from Lyme disease, he focused exclusively on his painting. Now, 
this is what he looked like younger. We did a thing on John Lurie and we showed, because it was his birthday one time, we showed what he looked like now, but that's what he looked like younger. That's what he looked like when he starred in such John Jeremy, Jim Jeremush films as uh, Stranger Than Paradise, which I love. Uh, here's some Lounge Lizard records, which I've shown before. There he is on the end. What does that say down there? Live in Tokyo, big heart. Okay, there he is. Where he wrote, yeah, he wrote quite a bit or most of this music. Uh, the Lounge Lizards, just a different... Uh, uh, bright color. I'm going to show you a couple more. This one is uh, like more of a fusion. Uh, Philharmonic with that. Now, uh, uh, Theo Macero uh, was a man that produced so many great jazz albums, I think with Columbia. I'm going to have to look at some of them again. But a very famous name anyway. But that shows how much they were getting around. And uh, here's just one more quick one to take a look at clean cover of the lounge lizards so uh in this what turned out to be bourdain's last episode uh john boiled eggs for their meal <laughs> about a week before anthony died he met up with john and bought his painting titled the sky is falling i am learning to live with it for nineteen thousand dollars the painting was auctioned with many other of Bourdain's belongings and launched a scholarship fund in his memory at the Culinary Institute of America, which is a good thing. Anthony was named the Food Writer of the Year in 2001 by Bon Appetit magazine and his no, no Reservations won a Creative Arts Emmy Award for Outstanding Cinematography as well as the Critics' Choice Best Reality Series Award and Parts Unknown won the Emmy Award for Outstanding Informational Series for 2013, 2015, and 2018, as well as a Peabody, Peabody Award in 2013. He produced the documentary, and this is what I did, uh, Jeremiah Towers, The Last Ma Magnificent. Uh, here's a Jeremiah Towers cookbook which I use when making gumbo and a lot of other things now we went to his restaurant many years ago after tripping onto a, uh, a black tie or whatever uh, party in the streets for the Philharmonic we just happened to walk around and there it was and then there black was the, the black and white ball we were not black and white but we uh, became a part of it and marched around with them. And we found we were getting hungry. We found in this alleyway, there was this neon sign, I believe that said stars. We opened it up and it was a huge, huge restaurant that belonged to Jeremiah Towers. And uh, Jeremiah, this was a story of Chef Towers' journey as a major pioneer in the culinary style of California cuisine. The film was nominated for a James Beard Award for Best Documentary. Um, Jeremiah Towers worked with uh, Alice Waters at her restaurant. I think she got all of the, almost all, if not all of the uh, accolades uh, when probably should have belonged to Jeremiah Towers. Anyway, it was said on the day of Anthony's death that he was heir to the spirit of Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, the Smithsonian declared him as the original rock star of the culinary world, and he was also characterized as the culinary bad boy because he would uh, talk about the booze and the drugs he was uh, taking as a younger person. Anthony was quoted as saying that a chicken McNugget was the most disgusting thing he ever ate, despite his fondness for Popeye's chicken. And I do, too. We like Popeye's. Last one today we're going to rush on through is uh, 
was born yesterday, Peter Weller, who I think we've talked about before, that I uh, uh, talked to him in New Orleans, smoking cigars. Anyway, very short conversation, though, shorter than I want to admit. He's an American film and stage actor, starring in over 40 films. He's also a television director of TV films and shows. A uh, short list of his stuff was uh, RoboCop. Uh, well, here's our criteria. Not too much exciting there on the cover, but it was, it's, it's kind of, I mean, RoboCop was, that was good. Uh, Ventures of Buckaroo Banzai, who, uh, it, you know, and they, they ended that as if there were going to be more Buckaroo Banzais. Uh, this one has a lot of extras on it. Jeff Goldblum, say. Jeff Goldblum uh, as a skinny guy. Uh, it, it was. It's a, if you haven't seen it, it's a lot of fun. And the bad guy was. Uh, all right, it'll be here. It'll be up in the uh, John Lithgow. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, an absolute must. Um, the whole name for it was The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. That was 1984, Naked Lunch. And we have certainly talked about Naked Lunch, but we didn't have the book last time. Now we have the book. Uh, and we've talked so much about these uh, hip generation writers from the 50s, Kerouac, things like that. And this is the sound movie soundtrack which is so good it's got a lot of original jazz like hard bop stuff from the era and uh i'm not sure if there's much in there let's take a quick look we got a couple minutes left uh ouch, sorry about that and i th think maybe when we talked about uh william s burroughs we did mention that uh, he did shoot his wife in the head by mistake when they were both drunk and uh there's that and there is this and uh i think i had also mentioned that uh these were a bunch of uh people who wanted to get high so they uh, became uh uh bug people uh people that uh Killed bugs. What do they call it? Insectus uh, and and sniff the yeah. sniff sniff the insecticide and uh, you know it showed Exterminator. exterminators and of course the typewriters be you know came to life and I have shown you this typewriter before and that's exactly why I bought this typewriter was because it reminded me of the typewriters that came to life and would fight each other in the 1991 film of just that. He was also in Leviathan, which I recall as being very uh, entertaining. entertaining, but I don't remember much else. Anyway, uh, short list of Peter Weller's, uh, as a TV director, uh, he directed eight episodes of Dexter and 10 episodes of Sons of Anarchy. So that's kind of, lately not more uh longmire four episodes and hawaii 50 15 episodes now are you talking about the the rebirth of hawaii 50 yeah yeah the new one so and then this i found was extremely uh well this was kind of cool but a, a surprise and i don't know whether you do but you sh should do you remember the strain that was on television it was written by uh, Guillermo del Toro, okay, and Chuck Hogan, pretty thick book, uh, which I read, and really enjoyed, then it came out on TV, but I had no idea that uh, he had uh, directed three episodes of that show, and that's just number one, and number, and we brought this up with Dr. Fow, too, about actually going to record stores, I mean, to record stores, to bookstores, and type, being touchy-feely and all that. There were three books. Here's number two. And uh, see, it says signed first edition, as we call those in record collecting, a uh, hype sticker. But uh, here is Guillermo del Toro's real signature and Chuck Hogan. 
there we go. See, I mean, that's what we were so happy. We took it up to pay for it a few years ago, and the people at the register said, wow, where'd you find that? Is there another one left? And there was another one left, but we took the best of the two. And uh, so that's just to show you how how much fun you can actually have when you uh, when you don't use Amazon. But let me tell you, I use so much Amazon, it's crazy. But uh, we are getting ready to say goodbye. So we're going to do that. I want to thank everyone uh, who stuck with us, listened to, was able to learn from Dr. Fow and enjoyed some of the nostalgia here. And uh, remember, I must confess, I was born at a very early age. And nostalgia is not what it used to be. So uh, with those two things in mind, let me make sure you understand that uh, Kaplan will be here on the same corner in front of the same cigar store next week and probably be able to speak a little better. But thank you, Sean, our great engineer. And thanks to everyone out there. I hope you all had a great, great Father's Day. And let's look looking forward to a wonderful, well-deserved 4th of July. Take You've been listening to The Educated Retirement Show with Jay Kaplan. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. to learn more about your mortgage and reverse mortgages. And don't forget, each show is also podcast and on the KMET website.